crazy day how it was but I'm so so grateful to uh, be here tonight and to hear from uh, our brother from our, my friend Mike Luzine uh, if you don't know him Mike is a lead evangelist of the Calgary Church but uh, he's originally from Toronto and still a Leaf fan uh, <laughs> the Leafs are playing the, the Habs tonight so uh, the class should not be too too long I'm <laughs> kidding uh, Mike Luzine uh, he uh, when you, I was a young Christian, I uh, came in Montreal to lead the church, and uh, I will be forever grateful mm -hmm. for the great, great impact he had in my life. I was at that time not speaking English. You may say <laughs> I, I don't still today, uh, perhaps, but uh, it was so great. I, I learned so much as a young Christian with uh, Mike. I was not sure about what I'm going to do in the future is the ministry or doing my own career. I was dating a girl. I was not sure if I wanted to continue or not. And uh, Mike was in through all these steps. And uh, when I met my wife, Jillian, and he was there to marry us and help us. He had the big task to take care of the mess. Hello. <laughs> when we were a young Christian. Uh, so very, very grateful. Mike is a very passionate man. He loves God. He loves his uh, Bible. Uh, him and his wife are doing a tremendous job. And their uh, daughter, only daughter, is, I, I'll let Mike talk a little bit more, but she just graduated. She's a, an awesome uh, Christian. So thank you for joining. Uh, you choose a great class on a book that um, brings so much question. Talking mm -hmm. about this, if you do have question on the book of Revelation tonight, you can uh, write th these questions in the chat. Jillian uh, will gather all these questions. We may answer some of them tonight after we're done or uh, oh, by, uh, next meeting next week. Mm -hmm. Another way also to uh, submit your question, Mike put in the chat uh, is email address. So you can uh, email uh, today or later this week to Mike your question you have concerning uh, the book of Revelation and next week uh, is gonna tackle and answer some of them. So tonight we'll uh, go do a good chunk of teaching till about eight o'clock. And after that, for those, if you have other things, you can log off, uh, but uh, log out. But uh, um, we're gonna stay on with Mike for some question and answer if uh, you uh, you want. Okay. So um, so uh, I'm just gonna lead us into a word of prayer, and then after this, uh, Mike will uh, take the lead. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say we'll record uh, the class tonight. We'll make it available. We'll send it to the different church leaders. You can leave us your email address so we can send to you. And Mike is going to use a PowerPoint with a, a lot of material. And uh, the same, we'll be able to make the, the PowerPoint uh, available for, for you guys. So uh, thank you for joining. Let's pray. And uh, after that, the floor is for Mike. Father in heaven, thank you uh, so, so much for this uh, special evening. Uh, we are so uh, grateful to, to hear our brother Mike sharing insight, teaching on the book of Revelation. Help us, Father, to appreciate uh, the faith of our brother and sisters in the first century, especially mm. everything that they went through and everything they, they, they had to enter to, to transmit these amazing, amazing revelation uh, for us uh, today. I pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you can guide Mike. Uh, you can uh, help us to absorb everything that he will communicate to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pray, Father, that we'll uh, grow tremendously in our faith, in our knowledge, and in uh, and, and our gratitude uh, towards uh, your love and your plan for us. We love you so much. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much, um, Danny, uh, for those kind words. And um, uh, Danny is such a great brother and a great servant of God. And I have so much love and respect for him. And I appreciate really the opportunity to be able to come and teach this class um, with you and, and for you. I'm going to go ahead and start. I think everyone is muted, so I won't, I won't mute. By the way, if the music stopped in the middle of that song, that was me. Um, so I, I, I promise um, uh, that I will have w at least one technical glitch for every service or class that I do over Zoom. 
So at least I got it out of the way early and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Mike Lazine. I was baptized in the Toronto church in March of 1986 when I was five years old. Um, no, at the time I was 21, I'm coming up on 57 years old. I've been married to my amazing wife, Helen, for uh, 31 years, and we have a 23-year-old daughter who just recently graduated college um, and came back to Calgary where she's working remotely for an advertising company in Toronto. Um, she is scheduled to get married um, in January of 2021. So it was originally this summer, but because of COVID, they have postponed the wedding to January. Um, I love uh, the Bible. I love teaching the Bible. And I love especially teaching the hard books, um, teaching the books that people um, get intimidated by, uh, teaching the books that are more difficult to understand. Um, the last uh, books that I have preached um, or taught are Revelation, Leviticus, and Hebrews. So and those are not your common books where you go to for your inspirational quiet times. They tend to be a little meatier, and Revelation is one of the most complicated and most difficult, and certainly one of the ones that I love the most. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen, and we'll jump right in. Usually, I teach this class over an eight-week period. And, um, you know, Danny knows me pretty well. Um, and he knew to get me to do it in two weeks, what he had to say was, bro, there is absolutely no way that you can teach the book of Revelation in two one-hour sessions. There's just no way. You can't do it. It's not possible. And um, so, you know, I'm always open to a challenge, uh, but, but we're going to go fast. We're going to skip a bunch of stuff um, that, that's really cool and amazing, and it breaks my heart to skip, but in two hours, we'll never get to it. Um, so this week and next week, we're going to rocket through the vast majority of the book of Revelation, and we're going to um, dig deep, um, but but uh, we have to be ready. Um, I had three cups of espresso to prepare myself to move fast, um, and we'll have to be prepared to receive a lot of Bible, a lot of info, and a lot of stuff fast. If you have questions, write them down and send them to me. But without further ado, let's uh, jump in. So all of you, of course, recognize um, that Greek word right away. That's apocalypsis, which means the apocalypse, which actually is the Greek name for the book of Revelation. Um, it means to lay bare or to make naked, to disclose um, a truth or an instruction um, used of events by which things or states or person hitherto withdrawn from view are made visible to all. In other words, bringing things, bringing things into light and allowing us to see things, uh, a manifestation or an appearance. Now, we read the book of Revelation and we say, what on earth is this all about? This is craziness. This is, I mean, dragons and beasts and what and throwing, you know, mountains into the sea. What is going on? Uh, but it was a very common and popular form of writing in Jewish communities uh, between, you know, about 200 uh, BC and 200 AD. Um, so for them, for we read it and we're confused. They read it and they got it. They got it right away. They knew exactly what the author was doing. He was bringing things to light, but through images and visions. Okay. Uh, the book of Revelation was universally accepted as being inspired by the early church. There was no question about its authenticity. It was widely circulated. So it's addressed to seven churches in the province of Asia, which is um, uh, Western Turkey. Um, and it was circulated to those churches and far beyond. It was quoted early and often by the church fathers. Uh, it was included in the Muratorian Canon. So the Muratorian Canon is one of the first lists of the Bible books that were accepted as authentic by the early church. The Murator Mur Muratorian Canon um, was published in about 170 AD and contains most of what we re recognize as the New Testament today and nothing beyond. And the book of Revelation is included in that canon. And John was generally accepted as the author. Seems better. A couple yeah. quotes from, I'm going to go ahead and, and do the mute thing, and I'll unmute all of you later.
Okay, so you're all muted. Love you. Um, uh, quoted early and often, Irenaeus wrote this about the book of Revelation, for it was sent not long ago, but almost in our generation near the end of Domitian's reign. It, Irenaeus wrote about 180 AD and recognized the book and recognized when it was written. Uh, Justin Martyr in 130 AD wrote, a certain man among us whose name was John, one of the apostles of Christ, prophesied in a revelation made to him that those who believe on Christ would spend a thousand years in Jerusalem. That's Justin Martyr, 130 AD. And many, many other of the early church fathers quoted from it and recognized it as being authentic. There's a few different ways to actually read the book or to understand the book. And so let me go through a few of them. Um, the preterist view, which is the view that, that, that I'm going to teach and what I believe, um, is this, that the book refers to events that were fulfilled in the first century or shortly thereafter. It was written primarily to encourage the original readers. Uh, therefore, um, this view holds that the book must be interpreted through the eyes of its first century recipients in order to understand it correctly. Um, so it's a very historical view that they were given it, they received it, they understood it in their time period. And when we read it 2000 years later, we have to try to put ourselves in their shoes. There's the historist view, uh, that the view that the book provides a panoramic view of the future of the church. This view believes that the symbols in the book can be identified with specific events in church history. The beast in chapter 13 generally is identified as the papacy, and his downfall is brought about by the Protestant Reformation. The book, therefore, begins at Pentecost and ends with the second coming of Christ. As such, it would encourage Christians no matter what, when they live. This was a view espoused by the Protestant reformers. Basically, what they believe was that um, the Roman Empire, which persecuted the Christians, morphed into the Roman Catholic Church. And that, you know, Christ's punishment upon it is, is what's being described in the book. And so they, of course, are the, you know, kind of heroic Christians of the Reformation. Um, the idealist view basically states that the book in and of itself doesn't really describe anything in particular, but it's rather an ideal. The ideal of evil persecuting the good and the church and good triumphing over evil and God delivering us. And so no specific prophecy in it can be applied to anything historical. It's rather just a story of good triumphing over evil. And then finally, the futurist view, which is the, the premillennial view, the postmillennial view, a lot of what we in the 20th century came to understand and, and which was widely taught in the evangelical and Pentecostal movements that Apart from the first few chapters, the book depicts events with, uh, which immediately precede the second coming of Christ. Therefore, the book has yet to be fulfilled or is currently being fulfilled, and its value is primarily for Christians who will be living at the time Jesus returns. You know, it's, it's the view that was espoused by Hal Lindsey and Late Great Planet Earth, by the evangelical movements, um, especially um, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Um, which tries to uh, use all of the symbols in the book of Revelation for current events. Okay, about uh, understanding the book of Revelation. Number one, it's a series of visions, so you have to try to visualize it. In other words, um, we can't just kind of take the book and try to make everything literal. It's a vision. Read a vision, sit and think about it. Imagine what it was like for John to receive it. Imagine what John would have thought when he received it. When he transmitted it to the early church, when he transmitted it to the seven churches of Asia, how would they have received it and what would they have seen and what would they have interpreted from these visions? Um, do, secondly, don't assume it flows chronologically. One of the mistakes we make is we just try to pin one vision onto the next and they just go one, two, three, four, five, six, and each one precedes the other. It's a series of visions. Some of them are, are, are visions, different visions of the same events. 
And we're going to talk about that when we talk about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath, which are all the same vision, just from three different vantage points. Um, so you can't just pin them all together. They're all individual. Um, the things that go together usually indicate, and we'll see one of them tonight, usually indicate clearly that they fit together somehow. Um, thirdly, let the signs interpret themselves. In other words, don't try to jam interpretations into the signs. A lot of them actually identify what they are. So let them stand for what they are and don't feel you have to force something into them. Fourth, move from simple to complex. There are some things in the book of Revelation, um, some of the visions that you will see that are very simple, that are self-identified, that are obvious. Start with that right? Start with the ones that are obvious uh, and then let those kind of at least give you the framework and then tackle the things that are more complex. We get into trouble when we grab the most complex visions and we try to fabricate some kind uh, of interpretation of it and then we jam all the simple ones into that um, and we actually are not particularly faithful to the text when we do that. Um, don't overinterpret, right? Um, Occam's razor, usually the simplest answer is the correct answer. Um, if you hear hoofbeats, it's usually a horse and not a zebra. Unless, of course, you're um, walking on, this, on the uh, you know, safari in Africa, in which case may, maybe it is a zebra. But if you're in North America, it's a horse. Um, when you're reading the Bible, don't overinterpret. Um, try to understand the simplest possible um, interpretation. Uh, remember the original audience, right? It was not written to you and me. It was not written for the reformers of the 15 and 1600s. It was not written to the evangelical movement of the 1900s and the 20th century. It was written to the first century Christians. It had to mean something to them. Uh, be faithful to the historical context, right? Like this was written in a context. It should fit somehow into that context. And finally, Sometimes I don't know is the best answer. Um, there are some stuff in here. I mean, and I, I've taught this book now four times. Um, I've read it 20 or 30 times in my life. I've read 20 books um, on it. I've read books on the Roman Empire to try to get the historical narrative around it. Um, there's still stuff in it that I don't know. Sometimes that's our best answer. Okay, the breakdown. Most of the book of Revelation is fulfilled. So the first five chapters are kind of the setup for the book. There's an intro where um, God or Jesus, Jesus rather, appears to John and tells him he's going to give him a revelation. Uh, then there's letters to the churches of Asia. Uh, and then there's a scene with John in the throne room of God. Uh, and nothing has been revealed yet. And that's kind of the present, um, the present uh, tense. Um, at the very end of the book, the last two and a half chapters deal with the eventual second coming of Jesus. And they're, they're framed, right? They frame um, all of the middle, which is what must soon take place. Um, the words, the time is near and what must soon take place occur several times uh, in that context. And those chapters deal with the historical setting, right? So the beginning is the intro, the ending is the return of Jesus a long time in the future. But what we're going to focus on really is the meat of the, of the book, which is what must soon take place. This is how I usually teach it. I teach it over um, eight or nine weeks. Um, week one through three, I'll deal with, as you can see there, um, the dragon and his allies, the fall of Babylon the Great. And then we take a break and then we hit it again um, week um, uh, uh, three, four, uh, four, five, and six. And then usually I don't squeeze it all into six weeks. So I have an extra week to hit what I haven't hit yet. And um, also to answer questions and deal with other things. Uh, but we're going to hit the first, the, the first three tonight, the dragon as, and his allies and the fall of Babylon the Great. Okay, chapter one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads these words of prophecy and blessed is the one who hears them and takes heart um, in what is written in it because the time is near. Right out of the gate, what does he say? 
what must soon take place and the time is near. This has got to be relevant to the recipients, to John and to the early Christians. It's got to be relevant to things that they're suffering, that they are going through, and that they are enduring. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And that's John getting ready to receive the revelation. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Among the lampstands was someone like the son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head, was, his head and hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came the sharp double-edged sword. His faith was, face was like the shining sun in all its brilliant brilliance. And I saw him, and I fell at his feet as though dead, and he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I, am, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Haiti. One of the three amazing visions of Jesus that we see in the book of Revelation. Um, chapter um, 19, we see Jesus, the warrior king, leading the armies of heaven. Chapter 5, we see Jesus, the lamb that was slain, whose blood purchased men for God. And here in chapter 1, we see Jesus, the risen God, who was dead and yet now is alive forever and ever. Therefore, write down what you have seen. And what is now and what will soon take place, or what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars, the stars you saw in my right hand, um, and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. And that's most of chapter one. We see, you know, in the, in the chapter, focuses on what? God, Jesus, an angel, John, and the seven churches of Asia. Blessed are those who hear, who read, who hear, and who take, take heart. And he mentioned several times in the chapter that this will soon take place and that the time is near. Um, John himself is exiled on the island of Patmos, he says, because of the testimony of Jesus. He's been persecuted. John was an elder in the church in Ephesus, which is one of the seven churches of Western Turkey or Asia, as it's called in the Bible. Um, he was persecuted, he was suffering, and he'd been exiled on an island off the coast of Turkey. You can visit the island. Um, you know, it's a common destination for Christian travelers. You can walk around the island of Patmos and imagine your John getting ready to receive the revelation. Um, and he is writing a persecuted brother to his persecuted brethren in the seven churches of Asia, right? Your brother and companion in suffering and in endurance. The letter is specifically addressed to the seven churches of Asia. Um, it says of Jesus that he holds the key to death and Hades in his hand. Hades here is not hell. Hell is a different entity. Hell is from the Greek word Gehenna, which is the lake of fire, which is the second death, which is the final destination of the unrighteous. Hades is the realm of the dead. It's where everyone goes to await judgment when they die. Um, and then he talks about the seven stars and the seven lampstands. Key concepts. Um, there's a lot of numbers in the book of Revelation. It's kind of important to look at what some of these numbers represent. Seven is the number for completion or perfection. Seven churches, seven angels, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven plagues, seven lampstands, seven stars. It comes up over and over and over. It's a completed amount. It's a perfected amount. Of course, we know God, what, created the earth and the stars and the sky and everyone and everything in seven days. It's a completion. Um, three and a half is mentioned numerous times. Three and a half days, 42 months, which, of course, is three and a half years. 1,260 days, which is almost three and a half years in our calendar, but is exactly three and a half years in the Jewish calendar. And then time, times, and half a time, right? Times, one, 
times two, half a time three, one, two, or about the half, uh, one, two, three and a half. Um, it's a time generally used to describe a time of persecution or protection. We're going to see that as we go through it. Um, but referring to an, uh, a finite period and a shorter period. Okay. Uh, two witnesses, four living creatures, 12 is mentioned numerous times. 12 is the religious number. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, used frequently to refer to the religious context or the church context or the is Israel context. 666, of course, one of the most famous numbers of the book of Revelation. We're going to hit that tonight. Um, man's number and also the number of the beast. And then 1,000. Um, signifying what? An immense, uncalculable number, a huge number. Um, when, when the Bible teaches a, for the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. It's not an exact mathematical equation. It simply means that for God, a day is like an infinite, unimaginable period of time. And, and, and the reverse is true as well, that for God, all things are the same. Um, a thousand is just a massive number. Uh, an important concept repeated over and over in the book is the concept of persecution. John has been persecuted. The early Christians are being persecuted. They're facing enormous pressure. And it's mentioned over and over and over and over again. Um, I'm not going to read all these, but you'll see that the bold, the word that I bolded, and most of them are patient endurance. That word occurs countless times. He, he tells the Christians, right? God tells John to tell the Christians, you have to patiently endure. I'm not going to fix your problem. I'm not going to make it all go away. The suffering is going to continue. I will deal with it, but you must endure patiently. And you can see here that it's mentioned in chapter 1, chapter 13 chapter 14, chapter 2. And then I want to go ahead and read um, this second, uh, the bottom passage here, which I think is one of the key passages to understanding the entire book. And it's from the seven seals, which we'll look at next week. But when the, the, the lamb breaks the fifth seal and the scroll reveals this vision, we read this. I saw under the altar the souls of those who've been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and told that they were to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had was completed. This is so key to understanding the book because it's the voice of the Christians crying out, how long, God, how long until you vindicate us? It's the voice of the recipients, right? Well, I mean, technically, it's the voice of those who've already been put to death for Jesus. But it's the same message that those who received the book would have been crying out, which is, God, don't you see my suffering? Don't you see the persecution? Will you not do something to deal with this and to help me? And the book is really a response to that plea because God says, I will. I hear you. I see it. I understand. You have to wait a little longer and I will act. A uh, key concept in the book, it's coming soon. So we talked about that in a little while, what must soon take place. It's mentioned countless times. They are promised that this is not something in the millennia, right? It's not something coming in a thousand years or 2,000 years or 5,000 years. It's coming soon. It's addressed to the seven churches of Asia, which we mentioned, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You can go visit a lot of these. These are archaeological sites in Turkey. You can go to Patmos. You can go to these places. Um, I went about 14 or 15 years ago on a tour. I uh, walked on the streets of Ephesus, Laodicea, um, and Pergamum and went to the island of Patmos. It's unbelievable. I highly recommend it. Um, and you just kind of envision I'm, you know, walking in the days of Paul. It's pretty cool. Um, chapter two and three is a report card for those churches, right? And, and most of them are negative. They'll be rebuked or they'll be encouraged to stop sinning. Let's leave it at that. Uh, but, you know, it's the report card. 
Um, here is where you find those churches. They're in the western part of Turkey. Um, right off the coast, you would find the island of Patmos, which is where John would have been. He could literally see the coast of Turkey from where he was. Chapter 4, John finds himself in the throne room of God. We can't look at it. It's, but it's totally awesome. You got to read it. I mean, basically, he, he sees God. He sees the elder. He sees the living creatures. He sees the angels flying around. He's in awe. He's inspired. It's amazing. And then a scroll comes out with seven seals. And someone says, who is worthy to open the scroll? And no one is worthy. And it says, John wept and wept and wept until an angel came to him and said, do not weep. For the line of Judah, the Lamb of God, is worthy to open the seal. And Jesus is, re is revealed. Chapter 5, the second image of Jesus as a lamb that has been sh slain. Um, and Jesus is worthy to open the scroll, and he, and he breaks the seal. And as the seals break, the, rev the revelations begin in chapter 6. But for us today, we're going to jump to chapter 12. Okay, so let me tell you why. Chapter 12, 13, and then 17 through 20 is kind of the, the big picture. It's the macro. Chapter six, uh, the, the, the seven seals, um, chapters uh, eight and nine, the seven trumpets, and chapters 15 and 16, the bowls of wrath, um, are the micro, how it happens, what specifically God will do. And it's unbelievably amazing. But this is the big picture. So we're going to start with the big picture this week. And then next week, we'll put into that picture the details of specifically what and how God is going to do it. So chapter 12 is about the battle in heaven, and chapter 13 is about Satan's allies. Um, the battle in heaven is more than a battle, but it's three missions that Satan fails in. It's Satan's failed message to destroy, a mission to destroy Jesus. Satan's failed mission against God and Satan's failed mission against the church. Okay, so let's go ahead and read it. A great and wondrous sign appeared. Hold on, let me get to my papers, sorry. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet and, the cr and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, 10 horns, seven crowns on the head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Okay, who's the child? Who's the child? Clearly and obviously the child is Jesus, right? He will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Exactly what is said of Jesus, what is prophesied in the book of Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah and confirmed to us in the New Testament. Um, Satan's mission was to destroy Jesus. The woman, the woman is Israel or maybe Israel and the church or maybe symbolic of all God's people. Um, Jesus is of them. Jesus is for them. Uh, and dr the dragon, Satan, his goal is to destroy the child and to destroy his ministry and his mission. Um, Satan is referred to as a number of, uh, uh, in a number of ways. Actually, the Hebrew word Satan means um, the enemy. It, it's not a, a personal name. It just means the enemy. Um, in the New Testament, he's depicted as the devil, an accuser, and a slanderer. Um, he's immensely powerful, sweeping one-third of the stars from the sky, perhaps meaning that he uh, misled a third of the angels in heaven to join his side, uh, perhaps, but not necessarily. Um, that's been presented as an idea and a thought and could well be. Stars are used to represent angels at times. Um, seven heads, seven crowns. He has authority. He has power. Um, his, his goal is to destroy the child, to destroy Jesus, and he fails in his mission, and Jesus is rescued. Of course, we, we know, right? Um, Herod, um, tried to, Herod 
tried to kill all the infants so he could kill Jesus and failed. Um, he tried to tempt Jesus in the desert and failed, tried to kill Jesus working through others and failed. Um, Jesus, you know, when, when Peter said, Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. What did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. He did not recognize those words as coming from Jesus, but rather coming from Satan. Um, when Judas betrayed Jesus, it says before he betrayed him, Satan entered Jesus again and again and again and again. We see the ministry, if you will call it this, the ministry of Satan fighting against Jesus and trying to destroy Jesus and kill Jesus. When he failed that, when Jesus survived that, um, he went back to war. And, and we read this in the next paragraph. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, um, who leads the whole world astray. Uh, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Uh, then he's going to, uh, I'm not going to read the rest of it just for the sake of time, but he is thrown down to the earth and he is full of fury. He is angry and he is oppressing all those who worship God. Um, Satan in heaven, right? Satan in heaven with his demonic angels in heaven. We say, what? That seems weird to me, but that's actually a biblical teaching. Think about the beginning of the book of Job. You know, Satan appears before God, and God says, where have you been? He says, from going to and fro throughout the earth. And, and God says, Satan, have you considered, you know, my servant Job, he is righteous in all he does. And Satan, you know, basically slanders and accuses Job, and we know how the rest of the story goes. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a description of an interaction between God and Satan concerning Joshua the high priest in the book of Zechariah, where there he's clearly in the throne room. Of God. We know from Ephesians chapter 6 what our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the forces of darkness in, in this dark world, and against what? The spiritual forces of evil, where? In the heavenly realms, right? That's, you know, Satan's interaction. And But we just read the battle, he's cast out, right? He's cast out, he's filled with Jesus, he's cast out of heaven, he's thrown down to the earth, his time is short, he's angry. And he is oppressing God's people on the earth. And so there's Job chapter 1. You can go ahead and read that in the notes later if you want. Zechariah chapter 1, where he accuses um, uh, um, Joshua, the high priest. By the way, Joshua is the same name as Jesus. Just just a little, um, it's the Hebrew version of Jesus. Um, okay, let me skip a couple of these. Um, Satan being cast out of heaven, right? Uh, what, what did Jesus say when, when the apostles came back to him from, from going to and throw, throw, throughout, throughout the nation and sharing their faith and preparing, the word, the word, preparing uh, for the coming of Jesus? He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. All of this all fits together. Um, the prince of this world now stands condemned, right? We read about it in John chapter 12 and John chapter 16, um, and that um, he was condemned at the cross, that they, he has been disarmed um, uh, through and been triumphed over at the cross. Hebrews chapter 2, by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power over death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The cross, Jesus triumphs over Satan at the cross, and he is saved, and Satan is thrown from heaven, and Satan is now on the earth persecuting the Christians. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who'd given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so, she, so that she might fly to a place prepared in the desert and where she'd be taken care of for times, time, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Uh, from the mouth of the surface, he spewed water to overtake the woman um, unsuccessfully. Uh, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So Satan is cast to the earth and is persecuting the Christians. Okay, chapter 13, Satan's allies.
And the dragon stood at the shores of the sea. And this is John on the Isle of Patmos witnessing this vision. And he says, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowds under horns. And each had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard and had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like a lion. The dragon gave the beast the power and the throne and the great authority. Uh, one of the heads of the beast seems to have had a fatal wound, but that fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshiped the dragon because he'd given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast and who can make war against him? This is Satan's first ally in his persecution against the church. Um, so John is on the island of Patmos. He sees the beast come out of the sea perhaps foreign, right? In other words, not from here, but came from somewhere else, came out of the sea. He resembles the dragon and he's given authority by the dragon, also resembles the four beasts of Daniel chapter seven. Um, each of these beasts represent empires and rulers and men worshiped the beast. The beast was given. a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemy and to exercise his authority for 42 months, right? For a limited period of time. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander the name of his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Um, he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All the inhabitants of the earth worship the beast and all those whose name had not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb uh, that was slain from the creation of the world. Um, he was an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Okay, so this is the first beast. It's a power um, over nations and tribes and languages. Um, it's a power over people. Uh, and the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. It opposes and blasphemes God. It persecutes the saints. It has authority over the whole earth and no escape is possible. This is what John sees when he looks out and he sees the first beast. There's going to be a second beast that's going to come out, not of the sea, but of the land. And he says, then I look and I saw a second beast that came from the land. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised authority for the first beast and on its behalf made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven in the full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power um, to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and had yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the first beast to be killed. He also forced everyone, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so no one could buy or sell without the mark. And this is the name of the, of the beast uh, and the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast for it is man's number. His number is six, six, six. Of course, we've seen that from the movie The Omen and from you know numerous um, extra biblical records Okay, out of the land, it's, a, it's local. It's not from the sea, it's from here. Um, it looks like a land, like a lamb, but it sounds like a dragon. In other words, the beast is um, religious in nature. It's deceiving. Um, it gives authority to the first beast and it forces men to worship the first beast. Um, it's referred to later ch later um, uh, chapters as the false prophet. Um, so there's an interconnection between the two, and they are both the two allies of Satan. It forces people to worship the first beast. So if the first beast is the foreign power that has authority over all the nations of the earth, it's obviously Rome. And we're going to look at a scripture later that specifically says that it is. Um, and if it's Rome, the question is, were people forced to worship the Roman empires and emperors? And the answer is yes. Um, 
Augustus was proclaimed a god. Caligula referred to himself as a god. Caligula sent his statues to Jerusalem to be installed in the temple. That the Jews would be forced to worship them at the temple in Jerusalem. Now, the local governing Roman authorities had the good sense not to put it in there because they knew that they would have a civil war on their hands. So they housed it in a warehouse and never put it in. If Caligula had found out, he certainly would have had them executed. But fortunately, he died before he found out. Um, Nero was referred to on his coins as the savior of the whole world. Domitian was addressed as our Lord and our God, Domitian. The idea of not buying and selling unless you worshipped the, the, the Roman emperor was an actual thing. There's something called the labelli that you would receive, which was like a certificate that you had offered sacrifice to the Roman emperor. Um, here's a copy of an early labelli from about 250 AD, um, which basically says we went into the temple, we offered the sacrifice to the emperor, we acknowledge him as God, and then they sign it and they have it countersigned by the local authorities. And then now that they have this, they're free to travel, they're free to buy and sell, and they are free to participate in, um, in the Roman um, Empire. Um, if they do, if you don't have this, you're in trouble. It's like trying to cross the border without a passport. You're going to have problems. Um, and Christians, of course, could not get one of these because they would not go into the into the temple of the emperor. They would not offer a sacrifice. And this is a real thing. When we when we went um, to Turkey, as you walk down the streets of Ephesus, you walk by these buildings, these structures that were the temple, the temple of Trajan, the temple of Domitian, where people would go to offer sacrifice. Okay, that's the mark. That's the image. Um, 666 is a mystery. Uh I mean, first of all, if seven is the number of perfection and seven is the number of completion, six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Man is imperfect and incomplete. Um, 666 six, six would represent imperfection upon imperfection upon imperfection or uncompletion upon uncompletion upon uncompletion. Also, another thing they did in the ancient world was they used these codes, which use numbers and letters. And... I don't have time to deal with this tonight, even remotely, but but if you, you use the letter, the, the numbers for Greek letters, you come up with Nero Caesar um, using 666 or 616, which is another variant in some old manuscripts would give you the Latin variant of Nero Caesar. So a little something for thought. Mounts wrote, um, together with the dragon, the two beasts constitute an unholy trinity of malicious evil. The two beasts represent the power of Rome and the willingness of the local religious authorities to cooperate in carrying out the sinister plans of Satan himself. Okay, I'm going to keep going until Danny tells me to stop. Um, and you can, you can tell me. Chapter 17. So we have Satan's two allies who are, who are Rome and the local authorities that perpetuate this, this emperor worship in this persecution of the Christians. Chapter 17. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel um, carried me away on, in the spirit uh, into the desert. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abom abominable things and the filth of her adultery. Uh, and her title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Prostitutes, and of abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman who was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those uh, who bore the testimony of Jesus. 
When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. And the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that she rides, that has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw, which once was, and that which you saw, which once was, now is not, but will come up out of the abyss and go on to destruction. The inhabitants of the earth who, who's whose names have not been written in the book of life um, since the, from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come again. This calls for wisdom. The seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits, and there are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he does, he must remain for a little while. And the beast that once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but for one hour they'll receive authority um, as kings along with the beast. Uh, they have one purpose and will give the power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And, and with him all will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the, the prostitute sits are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beasts and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put into their hearts to accomplish this purpose by agreeing to give the beast the power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over all the kings of the earth. Okay, man, to the Apostle John, what was the great city that ruled over all the kings of the earth? To the early Christians who received this letter, what was the great city that ruled over all the kings of the earth? It was without question Rome, right? What was the city that was persecuting the Christians? Rome. What was the city that was forcing them? What was the emperor that was forcing them to be worshipped as a god? The Roman emperor. Uh, beyond the shadow of the doubt, this does not push to the future 2,000 years, this is referring to the Roman persecution of the Christians and to God's judgment of the Roman Empire and of her emperors. The woman is seated on many waters, right? Many peoples, many languages. That's the Roman emperor, em, Empire. Um, seated on the beast, right? Um, which is Satan's ally described in chapter 13, the first beast. It's the same if you read the descriptions more slowly than I did tonight, you'll see that it's absolutely the first beast that is mentioned. She is linked to the first beast. She interacts with the kings of the earth and impacts all of the inhabitants of the earth. She is beautiful on the outside, but rotten on the inside, which actually describes the Roman Empire. <sighs> Written on her forehead is her name, Babylon the Great. Babylon was the city that persecuted God's people in the Old Testament. Um, Rome is the city that persecutes God people, God's people in the New Testament. Um, it is a symbolic of a nation or a city that persecutes God's people. She is drunk with the blood of the saints. That's Rome. There is a love-hate relationship between the beast and the woman, right? The woman is the city. The beast is the emperor. I find it very interesting where it says um, that um, he will burn her with fire. Well, who did that? Nero burned down a third of Rome in order to build this great palace that he wanted to build. Um, the links are unmistakable. She is the great city that rules over all the kings of the earth. The beast that once was, now is not, and will come back. Not all emperors persecuted the Christians. Not all emperors um, were offensive um, towards the Christians. Nero was bad. Um, Nero was was terrifying to the Christians. Um, and after Nero, the emperors tended to be um, not good towards the Christians, certainly, but less oppressive until Domitian. And Domitian was often referred to as Nero um, resurrected or Nero back from the dead, right? The fatal wound that was healed is Nero reborn in, Dom in Domitian. Okay. Um, Keener wrote in his commentary, Domitian is the new Nero. Um, the city on seven hills, if you know your history, Rome is often referred to as the city on seven hills. 
it's kind of a um, appellation for the city uh, of Rome. Um, uh, let's look at the set, the kings, the seven kings. So the emperors of Rome, the first emperor of Rome was, was Augustus Caesar or Octavius Caesar. Um, if you count out the first five, you get to Nero. Um, the next three all ruled for a period of a few months. They're referred to as barracks emperors. They seized and were killed. Um, but the next true emperor was Vespasian, um, who ruled for quite some time, followed by his son Titus, followed by Domitian. Um, five have passed up to Nero. One is Vespasian. Another will come and must rule for a little while, Titus, whose reign was short. And then the eighth beast, the eighth um, emperor is the beast that will come, Domitian. Ten horns, maybe ten future kings, we're not sure. Chapter 18, after this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority on the earth and was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become the home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit. Right, Babylon the Great, right, the woman, right, the, the, the prostitute that sits upon the beast and sits upon the many waters. Her name is a mystery. Her name is Babylon the Great. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. All the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adultery. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so you will not share in her sins, so you'll not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to the heavens, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasted, I sit as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, one um, in one day, her plagues will overtake her, death and mourning and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So this is the fall of the woman, the fall of Rome. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, right? This is also previously announced by an angel in chapter 14. There's three proclamations. Worship God. Fallen is Babylon the Great, and do not worship the beast. Those are the three proclamations of chapter 14, which we'll actually not even look at in this class, sadly. Um, she was rich and full of her excessive luxuries, and yet, and yet, was empty, unclean, and desolate. Um, it talks about uh, the nations, the merchants, and the kings who've grown rich and been, you know, blessed, I suppose, by her. Uh, but now um, the time has come for her payback in one day. This is repeated several times, this idea that in one hour, in one day, in other words, the great Roman Empire will be brought to heel in a day, that God's judgment will come upon her and the end will be rapid and quick. Um, then he's going to go on, he's going to talk about, and I can't read it, he's going to talk about three different types of people, the kings, the merchants of the earth, um, the kings who benefited from Rome's leadership and Rome's authority, the merchants of the earth who grew rich from her, and the sea captains who transported all the cargoes to and from Rome, that they will mourn and they will lament that when, when the great prostitute, when Babylon the great, when the beast are destroyed, that the kings of the earth who, who benefited from the Pax Romana and from Roman authority um, suddenly they will mourn because they will not have the protection of Rome anymore. The merchants who've grown wealthy off of um, the Roman authority and the city of Rome will no longer uh, be able to sell their goods and their wares in Rome. And the sea captains who transported everything throughout the Roman Empire will now no longer be able um, uh, to make money off of Rome. Uh, the excesses of Rome were well known. Livy, who's an ancient Roman historian, 
wrote this, Rome's wealth was incomparable. There were 133,225 palaces in Rome, each with 365 stories, each story with enough food to feed the entire world. Obviously, obviously he's, you know, the license to exaggerate is great, but his point was that Rome is immensely, immensely rich. And it was. In fact, they stopped growing wheat in Rome and in all the places close to Rome because they could grow crops, crops that were more profitable. Crops like grapes, crops like olives. And so grapes for wine, olives for olive oil. Um, these were grown on the Italian peninsula in Greece and in places close to Rome. And they started outsourcing their wheat as far away as the Black Sea and the Delta of Egypt. And how did it get to Rome? Merchants sold it, sea captains brought it, and everyone got rich in the process. And, and Revelation tells us that these merchants and sea captains and foreign kings would mourn the destruction of Babylon the Great. And we're almost finished. It's like miraculous. Rejoice, rejoice, O heaven and saints and apostles and prophet. God said, judge her for the way she treated you. Remember at the beginning, the souls under the altar crying out, how long, O God, how long, O God, until you vindicate our blood. Don't you see, God? Don't you understand? Don't you feel our pain? God says, yes, I do. You have to wait, but I will judge your oppressors. And here we see rejoice, rejoice. God has judged her. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder and threw it into the sea and says, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down. Babylon, symbolic of the oppressors of the Christians, which is Rome. And he goes on to talk about the destruction and how God will bring it about. In her, Babylon, will be found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who've been killed on the earth, right? Rome is responsible for the death of many, many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians. And in, in Rome is found their blood. The millstone thrown into the sea is symbolic of judgment, the same as the wine press in chapter 14, the same as the great battle in chapter 19, the same as the final seal, trumpet, and bowls, which we're going to look at next week, which is awesome. Um, the end is violent and dramatic, which it will be for Rome. Um, God, it's God's punishment, and it's, and it's um, God's um, judgment, and it is repayment in kind right? God doesn't judge them for nothing. He says, I will give them back double what they have done to my people, and therefore rejoice, saints, apostles, prophets, you have now been vindicated. And there's great rejoicing. The harlot is condemned. Innocent blood is avenged. Um, eventually, the bride will be revealed, um, which will be in contrast to the harlot, which is thrown down, and righteousness is honored. The great battle, uh, we're just going to skip over it, but it's an amazing picture of Jesus on a white horse, crowned with many crowns, um, carrying a sword. Um, on his thigh is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He leads the armies of heaven in battle, and they overthrow the beast and the false prophet, and they throw them into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Um, chapter 19 is a really, really, really cool picture of Jesus. Um, go back and look at it or look at my slides. You'll get them this week um, and you can take you can take a look. It's it's in there. He carries an iron scepter scepter right from Psalm chapter two. Also what we saw in Revelation uh, chapter 12. Uh, it's not much of a battle. It says he leads the armies of in heaven, the beast and the dragon and the false prophet oppose them and he destroys them and throws them in the lake of fire. It's over very quickly. Jesus triumphs. Um, the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, and their armies are completely destroyed. This is a judgment, but not the judgment, right? In other words, no books are opened. Jesus doesn't come down on a cloud with a trumpet. He leads a horse and an army into battle. Um, there's no individual um, action, judging of actions or deed. Um, no death in Hades giving up their dead. No trumpet. Um, it is a judgment on the enemies of God and the oppressors of the early Christians. As God judged Assyria, Babylon, and others, this is the judgment on Rome. A really good thing to look at after you read what we just looked at. Go back and read the final chapter of Nahum, which is God's judgment of Assyria. And you'll see a striking similarity to how um, that judgment is a vindication of God and his people and proves him just. 
Um, the final judgment is yet to come. Okay, two more slides. This is a chart of the, of the population of the city of Rome. Rome in zero AD was somewhere between one and two million people. It was the largest city in the world. It was immensely powerful. It was the greatest city the world had ever seen. And it continued on as an enormously powerful city for quite some time. And suddenly in the 400s, it fell from a population of a million to a population of about 30,000. And what's amazing to me is it did not recover for almost 1500 years, that it basically sat as a tiny city. The only thing that Rome was important for, for 1500 years was the Vatican and the seat of the Pope and the Catholic Church. It was nothing else. It was a, it was a backwater. It was a tiny, tiny town um, that was irrelevant and inconsequential. That's God's judgment. Right With great violence, it will be thrown down. And next week, we're going to look at how that transpired. The end of this, after he throws the beast and the false prophet into the sea, it says an angel descends from heaven with a great chain and binds Satan and locks him up in the abyss for a thousand years. Right, A thousand is just this immense, uncalculatable period of time. And it ends there with the beast destroyed, the false prophet destroyed, Rome, the, the Rome, right, Babylon the Great, the prostitute destroyed, and Satan imprisoned. And it says that he'll be imprisoned for a long time, and after that, he'll be set free for a short time. And that's, you know, when that happens, he is set free, and soon afterwards, we see the second coming of Christ and the final return of Christ. So you get this judgment that God had over Rome, and Satan is imprisoned or restricted. And for a long period of time, nothing. And then Christ returns. And that, believe it or not, is an awful lot of revelation in a very short period of time. <laughs>